All right, so let's go ahead and move on to item number eight, which is the study session. Um, item 8A, receive report on the San Mateo Avenue conceptual streetscape plan and provide direction to city staff. Okay, and with this we have uh, a couple of recusals, um, but at this time also as they recuse themselves, I'd like to offer them that opportunity to say any remarks that they may want uh, as far as comments from council members because they will not be returning. Well, I'm sorry, I, I, I can return. I'm going to stay and listen. Oh, to okay, I'm there. sorry. So, I, I thought um, you were saying. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to go back out and uh, wait in the lobby. So, yes, I live within a thousand feet of our downtown, and I will have to recuse myself from um, this discussion. Okay. And Irene. Thank you. And I own property within a thousand feet of the downtown, and I will also have to recuse myself. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to thank the people who volunteered for Coastal Cleanup, which we did, we uh, event we held on Saturday. I know San Bruno does not have a coast, but we certainly need cleaning up in different areas. So we had over 70 volunteers. It was fabulous. They went out and they cleaned up um, the areas around Huntington and San Bruno Avenue and around the train tracks, or not the tracks themselves, around the train station and uh, parking lots behind San Mateo Avenue. And they cleaned up and brought back over 500 pounds of garbage. Um, they also filled up one of the really big blue toters with recycling, so, and another blue toter full of composting. So we, we did a good job. So if you want to join us next year, it's always the third Saturday in September. So thank you all the people who volunteered and thanks for the Beautification Task Force members who helped set up and monitored everything and weighed the trash and all that stuff. So thank you, and I'm going to go home and watch it on TV. Okay. So with that, uh, it's going to be left to the three of us to enter into the study session. And um, city manager, you're going to begin sure. this? Uh, so you'll have two presentations tonight uh, with regard to the streetscape. This is a study session. No final uh, or formal action is requested of council. Uh, we are here to present the conceptual plan and receive uh, council feedback on that plan. Uh, the first presenta presentation will be from Darcy Smith, the city's community and economic development director. The second presentation will be from the consultant, um, uh, Jacob Tobias. And uh, this effort began in January of 2019. Uh, we came to the city council with an allocation request of 125,000 to undertake this effort to re-envision uh, and provide some additional uh, safety, uh, pedestrian safety along uh, downtown. And it's a, it, it's a product that uh, we really want your rich feedback and that's wh why we're here tonight. The plan will come back before the city council tentatively on October 22nd based on your feedback to, uh, tonight. And so that will be the action night. T today is just feedback. And so with that, I'll turn it to Darcy. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Darcy Smith. I'm the Community and Economic Development Director, and I'll be making a brief staff presentation to introduce this item. And then, as the City Manager said, turn it over to our consultant who's in the audience to help us. So the agenda for tonight's presentation, we'll start with the objective for tonight's study session. I wanted to give you some background on the streetscape plan since it first came to you in January. And I want to update you on why we're doing this. And I'll cover the community and city engagement meetings that have been held to, di to date because there was some extensive community engagement, some of which you participated in. The majority of the presentation will be the consultant's presentation, but um, I'll just touch on some feedback from the Planning Commission that was given to us recently. And I want to emphasize that while I'm making the presentation tonight with the consultant, this was a really collaborative city effort with significant input from the Public Works Department as this plan governs the public right-of-way and ultimately would be implemented by the Public Works Department through um, an implementation project. We have the project planner in the audience from the Community and Economic Development Department, Rusha Donde, who's here tonight, who's been working and um, instrumental on the, being the project planner and project manager for the city. And we have Pamela Wu, who's the city's new planning and housing manager, 
who is also um, leading up this effort with Ms. Donde. The objective tonight, this is a study session, so we won't be taking any action, but we would like you to receive our report and provide feedback to staff, and we will take that feedback back, and the hope is to get the plan back before you for formal adoption in, in October. So I'll briefly cover a few slides on the background. The 2009 general plan was really sort of the instrumental document for laying forth the policy need for the streetscape plan. Big surprise, it's 10 years later and we're just getting around to implementation, but we, um, we put this forth as a priority. The downtown area really is the symbolic heart of the city. I think most people would agree it really needs some TLC, it really needs some improvements. And with any masterful improvements, um, you really need to start with a plan. And so even going back as far as the general plan, there was a need for improving the appearance of the downtown expanding the streetscape amenities. There's both a safety benefit as well as a sustainability benefit, but really this is sort of an economic development tool. Um, the, the transit quarter plan, which is, was also an economic revitalization plan, also um, called for revitalization of the downtown as well as the Caltrain area and our bus quarters on El Camino Real. So that vision for the downtown is laid out in both of these cities' long-range planning documents is to improve the downtown, uh, mention things that you'll hear about tonight, like gateways, improved signage, pedestrian-oriented or, or sustainable streets, as you heard about recently with the green infrastructure plan. Those are really important today. And this was actually a short-term strategy of the transit quarter plan, ideally envisioned to be achieved within about one to three years. So we're a few years behind, but the real important need for this plan was driven by economic revitalization and that desire to really enhance the downtown to spur economic investment in it. So as I mentioned, the general plan lays out the vision for the city's downtown and it mentions many of the things that you'll hear about tonight, the expanded streetscape amenities, the beautification, improving the crosswalks so they're really clearly marked and appropriately placed, upgrading the overall kind of physical appearance of the downtown street. And I want to emphasize that this was a collaborative effort with merchants, with business owners, and with property owners. And I'll mention that in the community engagement summary section. But the goal is to create really a destination where residents and visitors want to come and feel safe and feel like it's a pleasant environment. So what is a streetscape plan? You have it before you tonight. We put copies um, up before you so you can look through the, what the ultimate planning document would, would be, will be. But it articulates essentially the vision of what the street wants to be. Um, think of all the great successful downtowns on the peninsula and they all start with a plan. Um, there has to be a significant investment in the downtown um, and that's paid, through, paid for through either public infrastructure but typically private development also is typically engaged in implementing this plan. So it really creates this comprehensive plan and vision creates a sense of identity. It's sort of like, what is it, what, how we want the downtown to look and feel? And that's articulated through a combined planning document. Um, this is really the foundation for future decisions. So without this, we'd bring projects forward or ask for funding for specific things, but you wouldn't have this coordinated approach that will help you as the city council make decisions about future investment in the downtown. And as I mentioned, private developers will also be required to implement this plan um, when they come forward with development projects. We've already been working with that. For example, the new mixed-use building at 406 San Mateo Avenue um, was going through the process during construction to finalize their tree selection. And as part of this draft plan, we were able to, to change the original tree selection to a much more attractive tree, which has been planted there. Um, we're having conversations with other developers in the downtown to try to get some improvements um, to implement this for a quick win. And the city also th thinks we can get some quick wins out of this, um, such as wayfinding signage for the parking lots, which was called for in the downtown parking management plan, which you, were, you adopted in January, and other sort of easier to implement things on a, on a quick basis, like new trash cans, new trees, um, things we do sort of more normally such as crosswalk paving and so on. So the goal here again is to create this consistent streetscape, have a cohesive identity, 
improved things that are really important to a city's functional um, abilities like lighting, signage, um, and more attractive sidewalks. And I think if you think about all those streets that you kind of enjoy walking down, it's because they have a pleasant environment. There's beautification of it. There's good lighting, good signage. This is sort of where I try to all wrap it up into one successful plan that lays out how we'll accomplish that. So as the city manager mentioned, the city council authorized the consultant services agreement with our consultant, Wallace, Robert, and Todd, or WRT in January, and that's really what kicked off the process. The preparation of what's before you tonight took about eight months, and the planning commission reviewed that draft plan in August. But there were many steps that went into it. First major step was analytical, looked at feasibility of different options. Um, we examined things that have been sort of tossed around as ideas for years, like how could we do angled parking? Well, you really can't. Can we do this? You know, why are there so many issues with the trees? Um, so we did a lot of research. There was a lot of interviews with the business community, property owners, um, even city staff, met with the police chief, met with community services. Um, and that led to all the community engagement. Because we really wanted to go out to the community also having had been informed with a little bit of information. So the community engagement process um, spanned a few months. And then finally, the streetscape plan preparation took the final few months. So community and city engagement sessions is really important to the plan. And I know many of you participated as well as many community members in the audience tonight. And I think one thing you might remember was our walk shop. Um, and we also did an exercise, as you see here, with you know put little children putting little dots on what they liked around the downtown. So we were able to get a lot of great input. And we also had the online survey, which got almost 100 responses. So we were able here to do their um, creative engagement ideas. Um, I think the walk shop was very successful because as we walked that block of the the blocks of the downtown, we got really great input. Walked into businesses, talked to them about what works and doesn't work. Um, the the community drop in event was on a Saturday afternoon, so we really sort of got that captive family audience that comes to the downtown. Um, and I want to emphasize we because this is such a broad plan. We talked to a lot of city commission and committees. Um, we visited culture and arts, parks and recreation, and the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee. We got a lot of good feedback there. And you'll hear about that tonight from the consultant as to how that feedback really drove some of the critical decisions and items that you see, see tonight. Um, and I want to emphasize, we really also got a lot of input from the business community. We reached out to them um, and we were able to meet with some of them and got really good input. So the Planning Commission reviewed this. They're an advisory review body, so they're not forwarding, um, for example, a resolution for you, but they did have two meetings, one in May. Um, the May meeting was just to review some conceptual ideas, so not the full plan that you see now, but um, they gave us some really good input on the conceptual design, such as adding more trees. Well, it'd be great to do. And also there's other opportunities for just plantings, such as green infrastructure plantings. Um, signage, really important. But they also sort of delved into what's the land use character of the downtown? Again, we talk about what is the city, city's vision for this street? Well, we know it's a downtown, but that means there's businesses there and what businesses do we really want? Um, so the Planning Commission has had an interest in looking at issues around the downtown, property maintenance, um, land uses, parking requirements, and we will hopefully be working through that next year. Um, but there was support for really sort of supporting that for family oriented character and kind of the destination character through making sure we have really good signage so you can find the parking through the Paseos, good lighting, good pedestrian amenities, bike racks, for example, things that are really important when you're catering to a wide audience, right? This is a street really from zero to 100. So you have to accommodate babies and, you know, um, a, wide, a wide audience. So that was touched upon. Um, installation of art. I think what you'll see in the plan is kind of theme of, of sort of being artistic and whimsical. And so that was supported by the Planning Commission. They gave us some good direction on that. So in closing, that final review by the Planning Commission was at their last meeting in August. And they had the same plan before you tonight. Um, they provided input and, and even broadened their horizons. So there's a lot of talk about Centennial Plaza. What should that be? What should we have there? Um, any changes to that because the city park would obviously come through with a really detailed process such as for Florida Park and go through Parks and Rec Commission too. Um, but they had comments on that. There was again this talk about art and aesthetics and how you express that. There was a preference to, 
for warmer materials, more color, which you'll see tonight from the consultant's presentations. We have asked him to, to take another look at that palette and you'll see some, um, some ideas tonight that could be incorporated. Lighting, again, really, really important. Um, also, there was talk about what's the branding of the street, and this would be a separate kind of effort, economic development effort, but there was talk about, you know, how do we incorporate the city with a heart, and what's our logo, and um, so that's a separate effort, but it was something that they talk about. Um, also, this has come before, especially with the TSPC and the downtown parking management plan, is giving me really good pickup and drop off and street loading zones. So again, a separate work item it is on our horizon and it is addressed, um, touched upon this plan. So as you can see, this covers a lot of topics. Um, Planning Commission made some comments and what we wanted to do was incorporate any their comments that we can address in the final plan. So that would be coming back in the final plan. So in closing, I just want to emphasize the outcome. We really were trying to achieve with this plan, and this came out of the community input process. So um, it's the community's vision, really, is to have this simple and, elegant, simple and elegant street, have these activated paseos, public spaces. You know, we really are blessed with Centennial Plaza in the middle, Posey Park on the north side, and, and those areas could dramatically be changed through improvements. Um, and we also want to have better street trees. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful downtowns that are really anchored through amazing street trees um, and enhanced pedestrian safety. And then more importantly, just a unique identity. So that's the closing term here. It's just a really unique identity. We think, yeah, that's the downtown that, that I can imagine. And um, what that does is just draws in people and it, it really spurs economic investment. All of the really successful downtowns have done this, many of them you know, years ago, um, I think it is a priority to the city too. So I just wanna emphasize, I know that there's a significant dollar amount, but we are identifying and always looking for creative ways to finance that either through private development, through grants, um, through our development impact fee funding, but we know it's an expensive plan, but we are you know, committed to looking at ways to finance this. So now I'll turn it over to Jacob Tobias who is with the firm Walsh, Robert, and Todd. He's a senior landscape architect, um, and he's been on this since the beginning, and is really, really committed to articulating the community's vision for this, this plan. So thank you. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm very pleased to be here again. Uh, I have, if you've seen me present about this, you're, you're gonna hear a few things. Um, that I've said before, but the main one that I like to say every time I come is how much I like it here. Uh, we at our office had honestly not spent any time on San Mateo Avenue before we, uh, we were chosen for this project, and we fell in love with it. One of the things I love about my job is I get to go to lots of different communities. Um, some of them we look at and we say, boy, these people need our help. Others, we think, God, there's a gem here. There's something really wonderful happening here. How can we make it a little bit better? From our point of view, this street is the latter. This is a real gem in the Bay Area. Uh, one of the things we recognized right away is in the Bay Area where diversity of culture and ethnicity and food and art, where that can kind of be taken for granted, this is... This street is one of the most diverse and most interesting streets in the Bay Area, in my opinion. So I think that um, uh, what we heard on the walk shop and in community uh, meetings and so on is that people in the community tend to focus on the negative, and that's only natural. That's how we are as human beings. Sometimes it takes a little outside perspective to remind ourselves of the positive. So um, I, I really like to start talking about this street in that way. Um, Darcy mentioned already the um, extensive outreach we did with the community, with um, various commissions, stakeholder groups. I won't go into detail, um, but this is at least the tenth opportunity for input on this plan, and I commend the city in embarking on such a robust process. We really feel that this plan is an expression of this community's unique needs and unique vision. 
Um, that's one thing that we always try to do with our work. Every single project of ours looks different because every community is unique. Um, very quickly, the goals established for this project through that community process were activation. Um, people really want activity out on the street. They want sidewalk seating. They want places to sit. They want places to play for their children. They want 24 hour, well not maybe not 24 hour, but into the night. That was something we heard a lot. Um, the second one is greening. Um, I, if I can state my personal opinion, and I think I got a lot of nods when I say this, if this project plants trees in the ground, nice big trees in the ground, it will be a success. Uh, if only it does that, and it'll do a lot more than that. Um, in addition to the trees, there's a lot of opportunity here for stormwater management and other types of planting, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while. Beautification, really expressing uh, art and culture and a sense of craft and a sense of care. I think that's something, that is one thing that people really want to see more of on the street and understandably so. Safety, so that's lighting but also um, crosswalks and, and bulb outs and those types of things for pedestrians. Wayfinding, how do you get here from elsewhere? If you're from out of town and you just got off the freeway, how do you know where downtown is? But then also within the street itself, how do you find parking? That's a huge, huge one. So uh, those were two priorities in wayfinding. And then just identity. What, and this is really important, uh, and it came out of our process. This wasn't obvious to us as consultants when we came here. We really needed to tease the, the vision of the community's identity out from your community. Um, there's what in this plan what we call a baseline set of furnishings and improvements. I would describe those as, as sort of the, the bare minimum set of things that uh, would, would create a successful project. They kind of tie everything together also. And then there's a series of special places um, that I'll talk about more uh, in more detail. There's a series of special places that have unique features. And so, again, the baseline furnishings are kind of the, the standard items. I'll talk about those in a little while, but just to give an overview. And then these, these unique and artistic elements that would be applied to special places. One of the challenges of this street is finding the right balance between that um, elegant, simple, clear design that Darcy mentioned that was very important to the community and then also that sense of unique character, special things. I think, as I mentioned, the street is very diverse, ethnically, culturally, in terms of what you can do, what you can buy, the types of shops. It's also architecturally diverse. It's quite eclectic. It's already got a lot going on. So in terms of this baseline, the idea is that we want something that ties it all together in a very clear, clean, simple, elegant way. And we don't want to necessarily overdo the fancy things, the art elements, the, the things that will, will add to the eclecticism of the street. So we're really looking for that balance. And I think it's just important to keep that in mind as, as we go through the uh, presentation. Um, just a, an overview. This is a little bit hard to see, but this is the entire project from, from one end to the other, from El Camino Real up to, um, to Posey Park. I just want to mention the main elements. Um, new sidewalks would be provided, clearly a need out there. Trees and planting, as I mentioned. Lighting, uh, we, uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, standard street furnishings, and then some special things. So gateways and wayfinding elements and these special places, the paseos, and that word was new to a number of people. They are the alleys that lead from the sidewalk to the parking, uh, surface parking behind the buildings. We're calling those paseos. Um, Centennial Park and Posey Park, those are, those are three of the special places. So because greening 
as I mentioned, is so important. I'll start with street trees. You can see in the plan the addition of many, many more trees than are out there. The um, removal of the pots that are there now um, and planting trees in the ground. And then another aspect of this is, is using those existing mid-block bulb outs to create places where trees can get even a little bit bigger than uh, in a typical uh, tree pit. And also importantly, balancing the greening with the seating areas and the, si and the active use spaces on the sidewalk. So those, where those bulb outs are, you can plant a tree a little bit farther from the building and provide more space for um, people to sit at cafe tables and, and such. So that's what the, the section diagram there on the right is representing. Um, the trees would be large shade trees. Um, they would grow taller than the building signage. So this is often a concern. Um, and what we highly recommend and have found to be the case is that counterintuitively, the bigger the tree, the better it is for visibility of signage. We know how important that is to merchants. Um, in addition to the trees, there's a lot of opportunity for other types of planting and stormwater management. So the, um, we did have a conversation with the team that produced the green infrastructure plan, which I understand you approved recently. This street has a lot of opportunities to manage stormwater. Um, the uh, Genvian intersection um, has a storm drain inlet right there and a a pretty big opportunity to create um, a real green moment that happens to be directly adjacent to Centennial Park, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this can really be a central feature. And then all of the existing bulb outs, both at the corners and mid-block, um, would be an opportunity both for just green um, to provide all the benefits of green, but also potentially stormwater uh, infiltration types of planting. Again, to reiterate the point about the character, that sense of the, the simple, clean, elegant baseline, and then uh, focused areas where you could have artistic elements. We talked, as Darcy mentioned, to the Arts Commission, and then also a lot of the stakeholders. Um, we're, we're pretty excited about um, special paving in certain areas, artistic crosswalks, artistic seating, and then the lighting is a whole um, opportunity to do something special. So segueing into lighting, you can see on these two plans, the top plan, that l narrow strip there, is the existing light fixtures. The next one down is the proposed. We did a uh, lighting analysis. We had our civil engineer go out there with light meters, and they did confirm what everybody said, which is it's just too dark out there. Um, So just adding a lot more streetlights will go a long way. And then in, in addition to that, of course, as I just mentioned, the artistic opportunities for additional lighting. Um, the Planning Commission had a lot of interest in providing a um, sort of a, a sense of flow with lights. And so that's why we're proposing that there might be a consistent lighting element uh, with benches and the seat walls that as you look down the street, you'd see this um, special lighting hitting the ground plane as well as coming from above. And then uh, seasonal lighting, providing opportunities for those. One of the, the, that is just that, that did influence our selection of a tree. It's a, it's a deciduous tree with an open branching structure. And then the paseos really need lighting and the importance of those paseos I'll talk about in a minute. I'll talk about it right now. Uh, the paseos are very critical, a very con critical component of this, not only because they're an opportunity for something special, and this was really um, reiterated again and again, that the idea of having some art in the paseos, it could be implemented through a competition or by commissioning artists. Um, these little moments of literally light and color and art uh, as they punctuate the street will add a lot of character. But more importantly than that, or at least as important, the, uh, the function of these paseos as a solution to what many people described as a parking 
uh, scarcity out there. Um, you approved the parking management plan probably a couple of months ago now. Um, it identifies that, yes, the parking does get pretty full at peak hours. It never gets to complete capacity. Um, this plan follows that plan, the parking management plan's recommendations, which are primarily to um, increase the use of these surface lots that are off the street. So the paseos become a really important aspect of that. Posey Park, um, it was definitely no, no, nobody was shy about saying uh, that Posey Park does not, uh, does not represent a success right now. Uh, the fountains haven't been working. Um, the way the park is designed seems to make it easy for, for, for people that not everybody feels comfortable hanging out with. They hang out in this park. I'm trying to put that in, a, in as polite a way as possible. Um, so the plan here is to really create um, a, a green gateway. You know, I was actually looking at some, I think it was some Google Street Views from, from before the time of the Caltrain overpass, and it was only recently that I realized you actually had that at one time, not long ago. Some big redwood trees right there. Um, so the, the concept is to bring that back. Large trees, lots of shade. And then functionally to really move the functional spaces, the usable spaces out towards the street, create fewer places to hide, um, make it a, a real usable park that would support um, additional uh, residents that will be coming into the area and also support uh, and provide amenities for people going to the Caltrain station. And then finally, in terms of these sort of special places, uh, it was repeated time and time again that the community feels that Centennial Park is a missed opportunity. Um, the, uh, the possibility of having um, uh, entertainment there, uh, lunchtime concerts or weekend concerts, outdoor uh, dance activities, all of that. And then one idea that came out of the community process that we actually hadn't really thought of on our own was um, children's play. It's just a great opportunity. The street has this sort of constellation of children's oriented uh, uses like the swim school and other things like that right in that area. So that was added to the, to the list. And we, we, we didn't get deep into the design of this, but we provided some conceptual programming diagrams for how that might all lay out. The importance of wayfinding, I mentioned mostly about getting people to this street from outside of the street, and then when you're on the street, um, getting them to parking, and then uh, getting them from those parking lots as pedestrians back onto the street. It can be a little disorienting once you get into the parking lots. And then one other element that may be implemented um, would be uh, uh, directories that help people identify what um, stores and shops are there along the street. And then finally, um, these gateways. This was something that the community was very much in favor of and through the process they identified the style and the size and, and locations of these gateways. We have a few concepts here um, that would require more development. Uh, important to note that they should be part of the nighttime environment as well as the daytime environment. And then um, the our our scope included doing cost estimates for all of this stuff and everything i just mentioned um may be more than one than the city can implement at once and so we also prioritized these items uh, into four tiers so tier one is represented at the top of the slide here with those images it really is that baseline uh, project Again, I think it's important to recognize that um, the, the price tag here is, is very much within the, the realm of what we see implemented uh, very frequently on similar projects. 6.3 million is, is very reasonable, and what you would get here for that, even the, the bare minimum of this project, it would be a huge success. The most important things, the greening, simply replacing the sidewalks, new furnishings, and lighting, and the signage, really important at elements. 
And then the next tier brings us just under $10 million. That was a number that's been mentioned um, as a reasonable amount that could be raised and through different means. Um, and here I think we add very important elements, the paseos, which are the most important of the special places because of their function in terms of the parking, um, that greening at Genevieve, um, the gateways and the greening at the bulb outs. I think that if you did a project for just under 10 million, this would be a smashing success. And then the second two tiers, or the, the last two tiers, three and four, incorporate other elements um, that I would describe as sort of the icing on the cake. A, a number of artistic elements, um, and then I think most importantly here, oh, and also a number of extra greening uh, sustainable elements uh, related to stormwater management. And then I think the two biggest items here would be Posey Park and Centennial Park, which I would, um, you know, that, that's sort of a little bit outside of, of the scope of a typical streetscape. You're actually adding two public parks to the project. So these would be nice to have, but again, I think um, the, the sort of 10 million uh, uh, target would get you an, a very nice streetscape. Since Darcy mentioned it as one of the important uh, inputs of the um, planning commission, there was maybe some concern that the, the palette, the color was a little bit, um, uh, I don't know the right word. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say cold because I actually think it would be quite nice, frankly, and that's why we're proposing it. That stainless steel palette is very modern, but there was the desire to explore something a little bit warmer. I, uh, I just would, would if, if that is something that's explored, and as a conceptual plan, it's very much in the, in the possibility still not to nail this down, um, I would just reiterate that it should be consistent. We don't want to add to the cacophony out there, right? So there wants to be this elegance, but you could easily imagine a slightly warmer tone for those elements. And then the artistic elements, um, I think they need to be selected with care and with an eye to the big picture. Um, but so this last slide suggests that crosswalks could be full of color. The special paving could have color in it, um, et cetera. So it, it, the, the, the range of possibilities within those uh, unique and art artistic expression elements um, we don't want to narrow that too much right now in this plan, and I don't think we wanted to imply that that would be narrowed down. I do think that it needs to be considered as a, as a whole so that there's, um, there's some sense of consistency, some repeated themes, things like that. Um, but that was one comment. The other, the other place where we did include in the plan some other alternatives was the signage, which could be another opportunity to bring in a little bit more color. Um, so since Darcy mentioned that as, as important input from the Planning Commission, we thought we'd bring those to your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. So that concludes the staff and consultant presentations for tonight. And both myself and the consultant are happy to answer any questions you have. I can accept public comment if there is any and proceed with getting your comments. Sure, thank you. Uh, anybody want to speak <laughs> on Val? All right, why don't we bring it back to council and uh, questions, comments? Michael, yeah, sure. please. So I, 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 I've been looking through the report and I see how important the trees are and, and I heard the consultant tell us how important the trees are. But I know that the trees also have a very big price tag when it comes to maintenance and they tend to damage sidewalks, they have to be trimmed, they um, get overgrown and block the street lights create, creating shadows and then people end up tripping and uh, so we've had those issues to deal with. So a question I would have is, are there any 
successful streetscape projects out there that don't involve a lot of trees. And um, if not, if the trees are a, a requirement, then um, are we uh, factoring in what our ongoing maintenance costs are going to be if we decide to go that route of, of placing all of these trees? I am hard pressed to um, think of uh, streetscapes that don't have trees that I would consider successful. That's a good question. I'm, I imagine there are ones out there. Um, we, uh, we do need to address that in cases where there's enough underground utilities, conflicts and things like that where it becomes an issue and you can mitigate for, uh, you, know, the you know, in some cases it's impossible to plant trees and I have seen some streets that have other types of shade structures and things like that. Um, so that is something that can be studied. But I would say that there's a couple of answers about just the, the maintenance of trees and, and selecting the right tree, but also planting it in the right way. Um, and we were, we did consider that carefully in this plan. Um, in terms of sidewalk damage, one of the main most important things is to give that tree a big enough tree well. So most of the damage to sidewalks happens actually quite close to the, the, the trunk of the tree. It's called the root flare zone, and those are where the big roots start to grow. But pretty quickly after you get outside of a few feet of the tree trunk itself, the roots get much smaller. And so just providing a big enough space is a huge, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of 90% of the problem. The other would be selecting the right kind of tree, and the tree that we're recommending is a tried and true urban street tree. Um, we can find many examples of this particular species doing really well in this kind of environment at full maturity. A um, couple of other thoughts is that we did select a uh, deciduous tree, which counterintuitively you think it's going to drop all its leaves and become a problem. But the reality is that an evergreen tree drops leaves constantly year round, and you're constantly dealing with the leaves whereas a deciduous tree actually ha is easier to maintain from that point of view. Um, so those are just some thoughts about the trees. Uh, it is, you know, there is a cost to them, but I think um, the value just outweighs the cost. And there are studies about that, about the value. You know, people have tried to put dollar signs to the value of trees and, and in terms of how much you get for how much you, you spend on trees, it's, it's generally considered worth it. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be you know, our standard response about, about street trees. Uh, they are spaced in this plan at 40 feet apart, which is pretty wide actually. So in terms of blocking lights and getting too dense, uh, we think we actually were pretty conservative in that regard. Okay. So. Okay. And, and I noticed that the, the report did mention the fact that we have uh, storm sewers running underneath one of the sidewalks. That's why we have to use those pots that we have out there now and uh, right. potentially could continue to be a problem with, with newer trees as well. We um, did, um, if I may, we did do a very thorough analysis of the utilities and we did identify one location where um, we need to do some more investigation of the depth of this. There's a very large storm culvert under the, mm -hmm. the northern end of the street. And so depending on how deep that is, that could become an issue. Uh, but we don't know actually how deep it is. Um, and there is one place where uh, we're recommending moving a water line. But the city already did replace the entire water line. And that, my understanding is that that removed the problem that was that was that was uh, preventing you from right. planting trees a long time ago. Everything so you're, you you've got it all. You, you're in good. You know the, you've gotten a, a long way towards making this plan implementable. We mm -hmm. we've have other projects where the utilities are a much bigger problem. So you're lucky, <laughs> or maybe it was not luck. Maybe it was good planning. Okay. So. And and one uh, one last question. If parking was not a consideration, say we had plenty of parking not on San Mateo Avenue, would this design, could this design be dramatically different? Could we do something better, more elaborate, more stunning 
if we didn't have to accommodate cars on that street? Hmm. That's a good question. I think that um, despite the fact that as a landscape architect and, and you know my, my office is full of landscape architects who love green and trees and wider sidewalks, we're actually very cautious about the notion of removing parking from any commercial corridor. Um, even if you had parking elsewhere, the parking here provides a couple of assets. One is it does support the business. It does give people reason to drive up and down the street. Um, and the other is it actually provides a buffer between the sidewalk and the street itself. Um, we would just have to study it carefully. It would be, it would be uh, there could be great benefit to removing parking as well. Um, or you could split the middle, split the difference, and, and put more mid-block bulb outs and more trees in that way. That might be a really nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. But we heard very clearly that parking is, it is very it precious. Is <laughs> so right. if you built a parking garage, that would be an interest, it would be it would be worth looking at what more we could do. Right. Um, the other thing you could do is put bike lanes in. And currently with the width of the street, you can't fit bike lanes and have the parking. So right. that would be another interesting trade-off. Right. Yeah, we're definitely in a, what, what appears to be some sort of a, a transition where we're looking to the future, and that future, by all indications, seems to be a future that has far fewer cars. So if we're, you know, as, as we design these things, and this is definitely a few years out, um, yeah, I'm just, you know, thinking, you know, is, is parking going to be that important on that street? If we have, say, a parking structure where we could accommodate more cars, could we take them off there and do something nicer uh, on this street? But um, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Can I just provide a little bit more? Please. Information. So I think we felt like with this plan, we would just hold the curb line. And, and so because we have great sidewalk widths now, we, we had some comments to narrow the sidewalks. And you know maybe that would accommodate the angled parking, the people, and then add more parking. And we just felt like hold the curb line because it's a good curb now. We have a good street. But to answer your question, in the full long range, you know, if there was less demand for street parking, possibly you could add, for example, bike lanes or um, bike parking or parklets. There was also a questions about parklets. You know, those are like they take the parking in the street and they make a little outdoor eating space or something. So I think all of those could be accommodated, but. A real clear goal here was just hold the curb line and then, you know, like a bike lane and parking is basically just striping. So we would have those options down the line. Okay. Also right. saves a lot of money to hold the curb line. So if you do kind of what Burlingham yeah. Avenue did, move the whole curb line out and get rid of the, the angled parking and parallel parking, that's some millions of dollars more. So I want to emphasize we did make some, some decisions that, to minimize overall cost. But certainly long, long term, we, we have options. And, you know, there's automated cars, cars, lots of options down the line that would allow for flexibility. Okay. And, and so since you brought that up, the, the costs that are uh, outlined in the report that show sidewalk replacement, that assumes it would be we're only replacing some, something very similar to what's in place right now. And, um... Well, in terms of the location, yes. There would be additive paving for bulb outs. Mm -hmm. um, so that would add some cost to add that extra paving. But in some areas, you're adding the greening to less, you know, moving paving, adding greening. But the curb line would be held. Okay. And again, as, as um, Jacob mentioned, the utility cost would have added also a lot to the cost of the project. In Burlingame, that utility, that downtown project was like half utility costs overall. Different source of funding, right? Um, but still added a huge amount of cost and also construction time, right? So massive construction undertaking. So we're kind of blessed here that we said we were able to keep the curb line where it was um, and and really just we have the width that we think is reasonable now. Okay, thank you. Laura? Mike. So I have a lot of history with San Mateo Avenue. Um, my father had a business for over 35 years and I want to say probably about 35 years ago, San Bruno actually remodeled the downtown area and got rid of the uh, diagonal parking. Um, and we were fighters against all that because as a business owner, you need parking to survive. And if a resident 
can't drive up and find parking on the street or a parking lot, they're going to move on and they're going to move on to Bay Hill or Tam Fran, which is kind of what hurt a lot of businesses on San Mateo Avenue. Um, in addition, they came back with um, a lot of these big cement um, benches, trees. Um, they blocked views. They took parking away. Um, and the city eventually came back and removed some of those and actually added some more parking spaces back. So I appreciate your comments about parking. It, you know, parking is a gem. And Michael, I don't know if in 20 years or 10 years it will see a decline in parking. I mean, I think people will still want to drive down to the store because unfortunately when you live in Rollingwood or you live up in Crestmore Park, you still got to drive down to San Mateo Avenue. Um, there will always kind of be cars. Um, clearly we don't have enough parking on the street, um, but I, I love the design. I love the signage. I think all that's kind of beautiful. Um, so I kind of want to go through some things that, that you know, just sort of in summary and sort of the notes that I've kind of taken as going through the, the report. Yeah, poor lighting. You know, I definitely love your recommendation on increasing the lighting. I think that's way important. Um, yeah, the sidewalks are pretty poor, and so we need to, we have a lot of uneven pavement, and um, so that's an important. Um, yeah, the unsightly garbage can, so being able to replace garbage cans. Um, I was walking down the street just last week, and the door to the garbage can wouldn't even close, so the garbage can's sticking out. I mean, it's disgustingly dirty. It's, I tried to kick it in, it wouldn't move, so I just kind of left it there, but it looked, it was pretty, pretty bad. Um, definitely not maintained, so the comment, Michael, that you had about the the trees and the shrubs. We're not maintaining our current shrubs, so that would have to definitely be something that we put into place. Um, but I will say, and there's not a street that I've been down that I will say is beautiful, that you don't look back and see trees. Um, you know, when you stand at one end of San Mateo Avenue and you look back, it's pretty boring. Um, it really lacks the trees. There's some bigger trees in some areas, and then there's sections of really no trees at all. Um, I, we definitely need to add the trees. We need to add the greenery. I think it's really important. Um, it sounded like in the report there were some code compliance shortcomings with entrances, some sloped issues, and so I hope we get that addressed. Um, I don't know what 2% of a sloped issue is a big deal, but it doesn't sound as big, but it probably is something that could be addressed. Um, bus stops not providing adequate accessibilities for riders with disabilities. I mean, that's a big deal. We've got to address that. I mean, I'm surprised we haven't addressed it to date, but, you know, it all comes down to funding. So I'm glad that's, that's going to be addressed. Um, bike lanes, yeah, there's definitely no, no, no space for the bike lanes, but there's something we could do. I mean, just adding bike racks so somebody could lock up a bike in certain areas and then walk. Um, I know one of the things they did on San Mateo Avenue, too, which is really kind of a bummer for the 400 block of San Mateo Avenue was... They made it um, a right turn only. It used to be that you can you can come down Genevin. Um, so there's a beautiful picture of the corner of San Mateo Avenue with the Bank of America. So if I'm at that corner on Genevin and I make a right turn to go down toward the 400 block, toward the 406, which is a new, you can only make a right turn and U-turn. So what it did is it actually really changed the traffic flow on that 400 block. You really lose traffic flow. Um, if you look at the traffic flow from the opposite end, let's say from Artichoke Joe's, there's a ton of traffic, and then they just make that right turn to Genevin and head out to Sanford Avenue, and they don't go down to the 400 block. As a business owner, that's, you suffer because you open up a storefront and you don't know it exists. Um, but I know for safety purposes, I don't know that that, that can ever be fixed. If there is something that we could do to make that better down the road, I, I would like to see something be done with that because I know how much that actually damaged our business. Um, yeah, limited greenery. I mean, like, trees are just one thing, but there's really can be some beautiful greenery and flowers that we can maintain in bushes. Um, really, again, I just want to state how much I'm not willing to lose parking. Um, I also noticed at Posey Park, um, it just so happened to be that one day when I was there, there was a, a mother and her daughter, and they both had strollers because I think they had twins, and they were pushing the kids in the strollers. Um, and they took the ramp up to the Caltrans station at Posey Park. And then there was somebody else with disabilities, and they were kind of getting dropped off to go up to the thing. So I just felt that that Posey Park, and I appreciate the feedback, was bringing the benches toward the front of the street so they're not actually hidden back there, sleeping on bench chairs. Um, I don't know, maybe they're sleeping into the fountain that doesn't exist. Um, but is there something we can do with drop-off? Um, or is there another drop-off location, I would assume, in the parking lot, and you can catch an elevator? I don't even know, because I don't take that. But is there something we can do with some sort of disability drop-off um, at the Posey Park? Because it's really kind of a big space, and that big space is going to cost us a lot of money. Um, 
Centennial Plaza. I, I know, yeah, I don't really know what the thought was because it wasn't on the council years ago with the purchase of the Wells Fargo and then to tear that down and to leave sort of some greenery, some sort of park that you can't walk through. And I know that there's been some footing left on that in Centennial Plaza. But is there, um, I mean, it goes back to parking. So is Centennial Plaza an important thing um, or is it also an entrance to a garage that's something for the future? So I, 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 I kind of, you know, I want to beautify the downtown, but I worry about doing something that, you know, in 10 years when we do have more funding to bring in a garage and that could be the entrance to that garage. Um, and we've put all this money into Centennial Park. So I, I, I get concerned about that. Um, I guess the big thing is, you know, you hear this all the time and we've all heard this, you know, what is, when, is, when is city council gonna do something about San Mateo Avenue? You know, we talk about it, we talk about it, we talk about it. So I, I really appreciate the sort of phased approach. Um, I love the signage that goes over the downtown area where it, you see this San Bruno that goes across San Mateo Avenue. Of the two designs, I like the one that goes directly over San, San Mateo Avenue. I think that's just beautiful. I think we've been missing something like that. If you come off of 101 and you come down San Bruno Avenue, there was gonna be an archway that was sort of a welcome to San Bruno, but we, we lost out on that um, because of funding. And it doesn't really tell you about the downtown, it doesn't really catch you that you need to make a left turn to go to the downtown area. So it's just something that's catchy. Um, and then you, know, you kind of get welcome into this downtown San Mateo Avenue. I think that's beautiful. Um, so I'd really like to see something like that. Um, I, I will say, and, and I appreciate your comments too in the beginning, is that it really is a little gem. As much as we talk about all the negative stuff about you know, San Mateo Avenue and what it doesn't have, um, there are really some nice storefronts and very unique. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, some, a lot of them have been remodeled and, and you look at it, really there's, I think there's more nice than there is kind of the ugly stuff. Um, and I think that, that business owners are really kind of doing a lot about trying to keep their storefronts clean. Um, I did notice, um, and I think it's come up before about garbage receptacles. You know, what do we, what do, we do about that? You know, seeing a, a garbage can roll out in front on San Mateo Avenue with this stuff kind of is, is disgusting. Um, there's even one business that kind of has a little alcove and it's got the garbage cans and so you kind of walk by and it's like, can't they just put a, a door in front of that so we don't actually have to see and smell the ugliness uh, of that? Um, so what's the plan for, for that on, on those businesses? Because um, I think that's an important thing. And then the other thing I noticed is that, um, God, unloading on San Mateo Avenue, right? That, that biz, the trucks, big trucks, can just park on San Mateo Avenue and go into their business and, and unload. And, and we actually watched somebody for a good 45 minutes who was parked on San Mateo Avenue just unloading his truck, 45 minutes. And I gotta tell you, it was a busy time of day. There was a lot of cars coming, coming down um, in both directions, San Mateo Avenue, but a truck was parked for 45 minutes on San Mateo Avenue. So I've heard a little bit about, hey, La Petite Pauline, there's parents dropping off their kids, we should have an unloading zone. Well, La Petite Pauline was here today, years ago it was a hardware store, so what's it gonna be tomorrow? We can't create a specific unloading zone for La Petite Pauline, and they've got a, a parking lot in back, but there kind of needs to be some of that um, where we could move vehicles um, off of Sandwich Avenue and block in that flow of traffic. Um, but I think it comes with signage directing them to a place um, where that could be. And maybe some of those side streets where they can drop off there instead of the San Mateo Avenue. Um, but great designs, great, uh, good feedback, even good feedback by the commission, um, planning commission. And um, I, I look forward, I think this is, uh, it's, I look forward to getting the funding from new development to hopefully we can eventually pay for some of the stuff to beautify San Mateo Avenue. So thank you. Uh, I'll echo some of what I've heard, um, but also going to the Centennial uh, Park. So my memory is telling me that we uh, purchased that with redevelopment funds. And if we in fact did do that, then I think that there may be some where you just can't, it has to be open space or it has to be something that may be restricted to what we can do with it or can't. But at the same time too, Back when that was done, it was supposed to be temporary. That was a something then other than the chain link fence that was there to, that had weeds and newspaper and trash. 
And so that was a temporary fix that staff came up with, with council support uh, and did everything within house. But if we're gonna start doing something with that, then we should be thinking about long-term. Um, it's called a park, which has been delegated as a park, but in essence, you can't get into it. It's very roped off. We hear that from the community quite a bit as far as uh, making some modifications or improvements. You know, also with the lighting, uh, we under did the street light some time ago, and what it was was, A, a the wind uh, is very strong down that certain corridors, and so we actually try to light uh, for a period of time. It was supposed to increase the light visibility as well as the durability. So again, I always get leery when I hear about, now we need a new one, and you know, it's going to make improvements because what we had had prior um, they weren't holding up, and it, it wasn't um, good as far as that's concerned. The garbage cans, the sidewalks, I mean, we've all talked about that, the trees. Uh, I think they don't like, the, folks don't like the pots per se. Um, I do think that uh, bike lanes and or bike racks, it, it's kind of due and kind of a concern with that interaction that we have between the bikes, the pedestrians, and uh, the vehicles. The phased approach, we almost have to go into that path, I think. Um, the unloading that Laura brought up, I mean, we all know that it's it's gone on for some, some time, but it seems to be getting worse, and it seems to be just the fact that um, it's not just a quick drop. I mean, somebody will literally just wait and with their hazards on, um, both for pedestrian use as well as for uh, merchant. Um, but I also thought with the lighting that there was going to be something that um, businesses, when they would go in there, that the awning would be lit outside, that there was some stipulation that when you had new businesses that would go in, that that would be what would help the security, it helped the uh, perception for people walking there and there weren't real dark spots all the way throughout with awnings. I, I think that uh, the Posey Park does need help. Um, and. and you know, it's newer and what have you, but I think that mound, obviously, in retrospect, wasn't well placed. And I think we've got to figure out about the fountain, the arch, all those little things that folks are looking for. Because um, when the last time I think the ad was done, I forgot the year you just mentioned how many years ago, but I mean, that was supposed to be the big, the big change. But really what it did is it reduced parking. Um, it had items that you know, we're good, great, and then not. We have that sign that's there, that um, the the marquee board, that obviously is kind of seen its days, and it's uh, half of the size it was because of the top part was kind of deteriorating, to be honest. So, um, I also think I'd like to have something that's acknowledged, and I I like the downtown San Bruno across uh, the entire street is as well. I think that that just looks more aesthetically pleasing. So. Uh, I think this is something that the community wants. Laura and Michael both know they've been in town long, long enough that we always are. When are we? Even if it's garbage cans, even if it's something, some steps and some phases. Uh, but again, of course, it's funding. So um, I'm excited, but at the same time, I want to be realistic to the community and what the expectations are and, and how long this project may really take. So um, I don't know if staff needs further comments or clarification from us? No, that is excellent feedback. Thank you so much. Laura, please. To the chair, by the way, I did like the comment um, that the vision should be simple, elegant, and unique. So that was good too. Mm -hmm. I think all three of us are concurring with that uh, statement. Anything else you wanna add? Okay. Um, if you have uh, everything that you need, we'll go ahead and uh, have uh, Marty come back and we'll move on to comments from council members. Michael, anything? No. Laura? No. Thank you. Thank you for staying uh, with us this evening and for your report.